You're watching Old Mate's Backyard Tech. It's 8.30. The password-stealing malware Predator the Thief gets a massive update. TPG complaining again about 5G. And Twitter bots and trolls making up horrible conspiracy theories about the Australian bushfires. From Backyard Tech. This is Tech News Today. 8.30 Wednesday morning. Good morning everyone, thank you for tuning in. Welcome to today's edition of Tech News Today here at the Backyard Tech Channel. Three more news stories I want to cover, all from ZDNet. Let's get straight into it. This one, this password stealing malware just got updated with new tactics to help hide it better. Predator the Thief updated again. Make sure your systems are patched and your staff are alert to the risks of phishing. A hacking campaign which infects victims with username and password stealing malware has been updated with new tricks as cyber criminals look to make their attacks more efficient, stealthier and more lucrative. Predator the Thief malware first emerged in July 2018 and is capable of stealing usernames, password, browser data and contents of cryptocurrency wallets, as well as take photos using the infected victim's webcam. The malware is commonly sold on the underground hacking forum and has also featured as a part of a bundle of six different forums for forums, I'm sorry, of malicious software. Predator the Thief is regularly updated with new capabilities and researchers at Fortinet's FortiGuard Labs have uncovered and analysed a new version of the malware. Predator the Thief version 3.3.4 which was released on Christmas Eve. It adds new phishing documents to use as the lure to hook victims, such as invoices, a previous campaign used as fake court summons are a lure. The malware has also been provided with more tricks to avoid detection and analysis. Using shellcode to make the malware more effective at detecting debuggers and sandboxes something it now checks for every five seconds. Researchers also note the configuration of the command and control server is now more complex and detailed than it was in previous versions, and that the encryption is used in the, in the connection. Another instance of making and anal analyzing the malware harder to do. As well as, the, the, as well as this, Predator the Thief appears to have added some fileless capabilities, again making the malware tr trickier to monitor. Quote, this makes it more difficult for analysts to analyze its damage to the victim's systems, close quote, said Yu Yue Ting Chen, security analysts at Fortinet. The will not operate in Armenia, I think that's supposed to be they will not operate in Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, Russia, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Ukraine and Uzbekistan. Russian cyber criminals don't tend to target these countries and while the exact identity of the predator the thief creator, creators aren't known, Fortinet has previously stated that, that it is quote unquote fairly certain they're Russian speaking. The full list of indicators of compromise has been posted on Fortinet, FortiGuard's lab analysis, analysis of malware, and I'll leave a link in the description below for that. To help, to help protect against Predator the Thief attacks, researchers have previously recommended that macros are disabled by default, and users are educated about the dangers of enabling them, ensuring the operating systems and software are both patched and up to date can also go a long way to stopping malware attacks being successful. Sort of goes without saying that, doesn't it? So that's dangerous. So with Predators being updated again, that you got to make, it, whatever you are, whether you're an in-house sysadmin, an external sysadmin, a business owner, what have you, update your systems. It's now more critical, especially now than it ever has been before. 
TPG complains of wireless attack by 5G on fixed line broadband. If only a certain telco had not dropped plans to create its own mobile networks, nor try to merge with the number uh, three mobile operator. Australian telco TPG has launched another defence of its fixed line assets, complaining that fixed broadband is under attack from 5G networks. The defence was made in the face of the 710... Sorry about that, let me just mute my phone try that again the defense was made in the face of a 710 aussie dollar a monthly charge that would have placed that would place on its assets if the regional broadband scheme also known as broadband tax were to be passed by the australian parliament Contained within the Telecommunications Regional Broadband Scheme Charge Bill of 2019, TRBSC, the broadband tax, as well as the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment, Competition and Consumer Bill 2019, is currently before the Senate Standing Committee on Environment and Communications, which is due to report by February 21. Echoing the comments first made in 2014, TPG said in its submission that there was no reasonable basis for it to pay the tax and not to ha not to and not have it pass on 4G and 5G operators as well. The telco said its previous comments had proven due to products such as Optus 5G Home being available. Quote It is a plan that makes these products compete with the national broadband network. TPG said. The explanatory memorandum to the TRBSC bill relies on a 2015 ACCC report uh, to state that made that mobile is not a threat to the NBN. It is certainly out of date. It is also certain that wireless attack on fixed line products will accelerate when the ACMA, the Australian Communications and Media Authority, auctions off the millimetre wave spectrum in the coming months. Could make things interesting. TPG said it did not quote unquote submit the conclusion was taxing wireless operators, but to treat itself as a wireless operator as a group. Sorry, to treat itself and wireless operators as a group. This is a substantial turnaround from its July 2017 submission on the same topic when TPG said the broadband tax should be levied across the telco industry on all connections, as well as over the top service providers such as Google and Facebook. Quote, the cost will be passed on to consumers and risk consumers shifting their buying preferences to other technologies such as fixed wireless or mobile that become compar comparatively cheaper because they are not subject to the tax, close quote, TPG said at the time. For a, quote, for a vast majority of consumers, low-speed broadband is easily sufficient for their requirements, and they see no benefit in paying more for higher speeds that they don't need, close quote. Oh, no, sorry, continue the quote. For example, the introduction of Netflix resulted in a large increase of data usage, and it remains one of the largest sources of data consumption despite only requiring transmission speeds of 3 megabit, close quote. TPG complained in the latest submission that the broadband tax would favour companies with wireless networks such as Telstra and Optus. The irony in the statement is twofold. First, TPG dumped its plans to build out its own mobile network in January 2019, claiming it was a result of the nation's Huawei ban, which resulted in it taking a 230 million Aussie dollar accounting hit as a result. Secondly, the company is waiting for a court decision widely, widely expected to be made next month as to whether its blocking merger with Australia's third place mobile operator Vodafone can go ahead. During the case, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission maintained a view that TPG would build a fourth mobile network if the transaction was denied. Also hitting out at the broadband tax was merger partner Vodafone However, it also aimed to take up long-time 
uh, also aimed at its long-time whipping horse, the Universal Services obligation, which is set to disappear at the end of the rollout of the NBN. So, TPG is complaining yet again. Now, we've been told many, many times that 5G will kill the NBN. Um, one thing I will say, all right, um, 5G will kill the NBN in speed, in sheer speed. But in, in price per, in a pricing comparison, I doubt in the very early stages, people are going to jump on the 5G bandwagon because unlimited 5G internet access will be expensive so from a performance point of view 5g is going to wipe nbn off the floor but unless when 5g goes active immediately you have unlimited 5g plans for the same price as a fixed line plan the uptake on unlimited is going to take a while you can pretty much guarantee it Twitter bots and trolls promote conspiracy theories about Australian bushfires. Researchers from QUT show that some kind of disinformation campaign is pushing the Twitter hashtag arson emergency. There is no arson emergency. As Australia continues to battle bushfires of unprecedented, unprecedented size and ferocity, a social media disinformation campaign is pushing a false conspiracy theories about their cause. Tweets with the hashtag arson emergency are coming from a much higher proportion of the bot-like or troll-like accounts than those with more general bushfire-related hashtags such as Bushfire Australia or Australia Fire. According to initial According to initial analyst analysis by Dr. Timothy Graham from the Queensland University of Technology, Graham came to look at hashtag arson emergency because it was being used by some of the more suspicious looking individual Twitter accounts he'd been tracking. Quote, they were really focused in, in particular on climate denial and the Greens being responsible for the bushfires and arson attacks being responsible for the bushfires as well, close quote, he told ZDNet yesterday, Tuesday. Those last two conspiracy theories, he said, the Greens or quote unquote Greenies in general have not blocked hazard reduction burning in bushfire prone areas. In fact, they support it to an extent. And while some fires are caused by arson, there is no evidence to suggest that the current season has seen a higher level of this crime, except for the fact that 150 people have been charged with arson. In New South Wales, one of the two states hit hardest by the bushfires so far, only 24 people have actually been charged with arson. This compares with, oh, well, the report I saw was 150, but that may be nationwide. This compares with 53 people charged with failing to comply with the total fire ban and 47 who have tossed lit cigarettes or a match. These are just some of the few examples of massive amount of bushfire related misinformation currently circulating online. Using AI to answer, quote unquote, bot or not. Graham collected a sample of the tweets from January 1 to January, January 6 using the Python-based Scrapper Twint and ran them through a through the R package, TwitBot or not. The second tool assigns each Twitter account a score from zero, definitely not, a bot to one, definitely a bot. Quote, Lo and behold, when I ran it through the TwitBot or, tweet bot or not fancy AI model, it showed there was really a high proportion of suspected bots much higher than we would expect based on all other hashtags that are happening at the, at the moment, close quote, he said. Graham warned that the analysis is based on just about, on just about, on just 315 accounts using the hashtag arson emergency hashtag. 
compared with 1,106 of hashtag bushfire Australia and 7,674 for hashtag Australia fire. He's quote unquote, at least confident that it represents a disinformation campaign of some kind. But at this stage, he is quote unquote, less confident that it is something on the scale of the Russian internet research agency's work during the US elections in 2016. Quote, I'm not sure whether it's orchestrated or the extent to which this campaign is being coordinated, but there does appear to be a particular focal point on spreading disinformation about arson in relation to the bushfires, he said. I do get a strong sense based on the evidence so far and based on the analysis I've done is that it, that it does have all the hallmarks of a broader conspiracy conspiratorial style of thinking and a far-right populist extremist discussion online. Close quote. More broadly, Graham's major concern is that, the whole, that this whole episode will be, quote-unquote, a bit troublesome for Australia, thanks to what he says is a, quote-unquote, unprecedented amount of disinformation and misinformation. Quote, a lot of people are confused. There's a lot of anxiety at the moment around people's ability to discern truth and to be able to find out factual information and to make sense of this tragedy as it unfolds, close quote. Quote, this is a bit of a warning sign for me. I don't think that Australia has seen anything like this before. And it's starting to look a lot like the 60 or 70 examples of other countries around the world where disinformation has become legitimately and seriously problematic, a problematic issue for elections and things, close quote. Government warns of fake charities. Meanwhile, as these common times of disaster, criminals are trying to cash in on people's sympathies. Well, that's not what I wanted to comment about. But here, I'm not surprised this has started up. We know trolls and, and, and that will take advantage of any situation like this, which is pretty much a given. I don't agree that there's disinformation and misinformation out there. I don't agree with that. Not to the level that he's saying there probably is. The problem you've got is some Greens backed councils are against landowners being able to clear their land and create fire breaks due to environmental problems and wildlife problems. Listening to media here yesterday in Victoria, a lot of people were saying councils won't let them clear their land. You've got people who, you know, hardcore environmentalists spreading the fact that if you create a fire break, that'll do damage to wildlife and fauna. The Aboriginals of this land who've been managing this land for over 40,000 years have got it right, and the Greens won't listen to them. Now, the Greens are saying, no, 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 no. We're, we're, we're all for controlled burns. Well, no, they're not. Neither is Greenpeace. The fuel loads in this state are through the roof. Everyone's saying the same thing. There is not enough hazard reduction burning happening, and landowners are not allowed to clear their own land, especially if the councils are backed by the Greens. Now, as far as arson is concerned, there has been arson in some cases. Yes, right across the whole country. That's, that's fair enough. Yes, there is some misinformation and disinformation out there. That's quite possible, but not to the level I believe he says there is. Land control is a big problem in this country. And the hardcore environmentalists, the hardcore greenies, are dead against land clearing. The big problem you have is you're not allowed to go into the forest to collect wood. The fuel loads are through the roof. Now, yes, while the window of opportunity to do a controlled burn-off or hazard reduction burn-off is narrowing, and that's fine, that's proven, no problem. The amount of hazard reduction burning that can be done during that window is also 
decreasing. So it's not it's not a case of you know the windows getting smaller. It's a case of the windows getting smaller, but the amount they can actually do in that window is also comparatively getting much, much smaller. Now, with the amount of undergrowth in the forest and four-wheel drivers, we do this, all right? If there's a tree across the track and it's dead, there's firewood for your campsite, you grab it. You're technically not allowed to do it. So yes, I agree there is some misinformation and disinformation out there, but not to the extent he thinks there is. So there we are. Tech news today here at Backyard Tech. Enjoy your Wednesday, guys, and I'll catch you tonight for the convos. Have a good one. Cheers. This has been another presentation from Backyard Tech.